Good morning, good afternoon, and anything in between. Welcome to the second day of the International Coral Reef Initiative 36th General Meeting. I'm Jennifer Koss, the co-chair, and I will kick things off. Um, we've got a slide here that explains our general um, agenda for the afternoon or morning and how we'll proceed through. So um, first thing that we will hear is um, from our ad hoc working group on the post-2020 coral reef recommendation. And there'll be a motion to approve what that group has come up with. And then we'll hear from our two other ad hoc working groups on restoration and resilience-based management and um, discuss the terms of reference for continuing those groups. Um, I think barring anything else, we can jump right into that. Um, and then you can review the rest of the schedule there at your leisure. Um, Francis, have I missed anything? Or are we ready to jump right in with our presentations? Okay. Um, first up was to be Emily Corcoran. Um, she's unfortunately not able to be with us, but we do have a video for her. And um, I'd like to congratulate all the members of the ad hoc committee on the post 2020 coral reef recommendation for all of your hard work. Um, I believe most of us know that the Convention for Biological Diversity that was scheduled to happen in Geneva this January has been postponed. Um, and I'd also like to thank Vulcan and for WCS for all of their support with this initiative. Um, so with that, um, let's play Emily's video. Hello, and thank you for this opportunity to give you an update on the work of this ad hoc committee. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Emily Corcoran, and I've been working as a consultant to ICRI over the past few years um, to provide support to this ad hoc committee. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the, the support, ongoing support of Vulcan to facilitate this. Given that we've only recently had a, an update of progress to the handover event back in October, this presentation will focus on three elements. Firstly, a very short recap on the objectives and composition of the ad hoc committee and a comment on the revision of um, CBD timelines. Secondly, to talk through proposed addendum to the recommendation that you've had circulated to you. And thirdly, to highlight the next steps for the ad hoc committee. We'll then have some opportunity for questions and discussion, and um, there will also be some poll questions that will be popping up on your screen, so a heads up to be ready for those. So a really quick recap in one slide. As you'll recall, this is an ad hoc committee that was established in December 2018 to coordinate ICRI's engagement with and contribution to the CBD post-2020 global biodiversity framework process. The ad hoc committee was established with three terms of reference that you can see at the top here. Firstly, to develop a recommendation. Secondly, to coordinate ICRI's engagement in the CBD process. And then thirdly, to communicate and advocate for the uptake of the ICRI recommendation within the new framework. The mandate of the ad hoc committee has been extended through to COP15. There are 40 members in the ad hoc committee representing 11 countries and 12 organisations. And it's co-chaired by Wilfred Derry from Monaco, Chuck Cooper from Vulcan and Francis Staub from the Secretariat. There is also, as you'll remember, an active subgroup working on communications and advocacy work streams. Um, and the ad hoc committee has established working connections with both restoration and resilience ad hoc committees, as well as the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network. When I first started to prepare this presentation, the situation was that we had a timeline that we had, um, we were building momentum towards uh, the second part of COP15 in April, and we were looking forward to the first face-to-face -face negotiations for nearly two years, which were due to play, take place in Geneva. Unfortunately, as we're all aware, the Omicron variant of concern has emerged, 
and the CBD had to take the difficult decision to further postpone the SBI Substa and open open ended working group three meetings that were scheduled to take place in Geneva in January. We're still waiting for new dates, um, although provisionally we expect something to aiming to see if something can happen in March. But this, of course, will have knock on effects for the second part of COP15. However, this timeline doesn't affect the substance of our work and our key activities. It just affects our timing and delivery. So without further ado, I will move on to more of the substantive elements of the ad hoc committee. I first want to turn to the proposal, the motion for um, an addendum to the ICRI recommendation. The recommendation for inclusion of coral reefs and related ecosystems within the post-2020 global biodiversity framework was ad adopted in May 2020 and included a number of elements in the recommendation, include such as a suite of coral reef indicators. When we recall the uh, next slide just coming up, when we recall the um, the zero draft of the global biodiversity framework had four goals and 18 targets. Restoration element was incorporated into target one at that stage. However, further to consultations, the new first draft one of the global biodiversity framework includes four goals and 21 targets of particular significance to coral reefs is that restoration has been pulled out and now forms its own self-standing standalone target number two. This slide shows the text of the draft one of the global biodiversity framework and how the current wording of target two reads. It is important to note that this is a new target in a new technical area with a lot of preliminary discussions taking place during the virtual discussions of the open ended working group three in August. And so a health warning that the language here may change significantly. Within the ICRI recommendation that we adopted back in May 2020, restoration was mentioned but not addressed in detail. And the ad hoc committee felt that there was a role for ICRI to develop um, guidance on the technical aspects relating to this new target in, in order to support parties in negotiating the final, final language. In order to do this, the ad hoc committee members nominated experts and together with representatives of the restoration ad hoc committee, a consultation was held on the 4th of November to develop input for drafting of an ICRI response. 12 experts contributed to the consultation along with the chair of the Restoration Ad Hoc Committee and the three co-chairs of this post-2020 Ad Hoc Committee. The summary of the consultation was circulated to meeting participants and it formed the basis of the documentation that has subsequently been circulated for consideration by this meeting, including guidance on the application of Target 2 for coral reefs and also a proposed draft text for an addendum to the 2020 recommendation. The motion that's presented builds both on existing post-2020 recommendation and the ICRI re resolution on restoration that was adopted in 2019. The intention is that the addendum complements the existing recommendation and provides additional information specifically relevant to target two. The text sets out justification and key asks, these being firstly, to recommend language to support, firstly in target one, calls for retention and safeguarding of vulnerable ecosystems as a prerequisite to target two. So that this, this can then set the ambition for restoration actions that are appropriate for coral reef ecosystems. And secondly, it, asks to include an indicator, live coral cover in restored coral reef areas to ensure that this target can be measured for coral reefs. More detail is then provided in Appendix 1 of the draft addendum, along with explanatory notes. 
Your consideration and decision regarding this motion will make an important contribution to our communication and advocacy efforts as we move forward in the final phases of negotiations. In terms of next steps for the ad hoc committee, the meeting focus will be on, or the immediate focus, sorry, will be on the resume sessions of Substa, SBI and the Open Ended Working Group 3 when these are rescheduled. There are a number of strands of work that are underway. First of all, we have been uh, reviewing the progress made against the ICRI recommendation and, there are, and are currently playing at with um, ways to, and are currently playing with ways which we can articulate what more needs to be done in order to achieve the objectives of the recommendation. There are essentially three remaining asks for parties to take up in this final run of the negotiations. The draft articulation of these three, three asks are presented in the boxes on the screen. And as I said, these are currently being refined and will form the basis of our communications and advocacy in the coming months. When we are finally able to meet face to face, we are working to have some kind of side event during the resumed meetings. An application has been submitted to the CBD Secretariat for a side event that would be convened by ICRI and co-hosted by WCS and the 12 parties that are listed on this slide. The intention is to provide an opportunity to bring parties that have been supporting the ICRI recommendation face-to-face -face for an informal exchange as to how the recommendation can be taken up in the negotiations, particularly relating to goals A, targets one, two, three, and also the monitoring framework. We submitted this application by the deadline of 3rd of December. However, of course, we're back in a situation of uncertainty. Um, and so at the moment, we're awaiting guidance on what the procedure will be regarding side events for any future resumed meetings. I would like to stress, however, how hugely grateful we are for the incredible response from um, ICRI member countries to lend their support to this event. And we really look forward to working with you um, to develop the event once we know a little bit more about how this will work. Another element of our communication strategy that we have been implementing will be to continue to use the WhatsApp group that we've set up to share information with those parties and organisations that are supporting implementation of the ICRI recommendation. This is something that we use mostly within session, but also between sessions to share information. So despite the current round of uncertainty, um, we will be trying to make best use of this extra time and looking to firstly follow up with ICRI member countries that are party to the CBD to try and better understand how you are integrating the ICRI recommendation into your positions and trying to identify if there are points of coherence or where we could add amplification across the community. We will also be developing te technical materials based around the three asks that I outlined in order to support parties and would like to offer a suggestion of a webinar to present these materials perhaps in late January. So we'll wait with anticipation to see what happens next. Um, and we will keep aiming to adapt and evolve. The work of this ad hoc committee is very much a team effort. And I would like to acknowledge the support of all the ad hoc committee members and your readiness to share views, review material and contribute, as well as the constant support from the members of the communication and advocacy team and of course the guidance from the co-chairs. If you're not currently engaged with the work of the ad hoc committee and would like to be, then please do get in touch as your contribution is always very much appreciated. In closing and before handing back to the chair, you should now see a poll pop up with three questions that it... Hey Moni, can you launch the poll please? Excellent. 
So everybody should see a poll now on their screens. If we take maybe 30 seconds, if everybody can respond to the poll, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, hopefully that was enough time for everybody to respond to the poll. Um, I think we had some comments from France on this. And then if folks saw, we also have a question in the chat from Dr. Crosby, let me pull that back up, um, asking what the perverse incentives were for restoration in Annex 1. Um, and while we get that slide pulled up from France, um, I believe um, Ian McLeod responded with one example, I think it's it's really anything that would encourage people to go full scale into restoration without addressing local impacts that caused um, the devastation of their corals to begin with. Um, but also knowing that that we can't wait for climate change to be fixed to restore corals either. There's some sort of a balance in there. But if you have ongoing um, unsustainable destructive fishing practices or really horrid water quality, don't think that you can go in and restore um, and, and get those corals back um, without dealing with your local stressors. Um, so if other members from the working group want to chime in there, I think that's the intent of that is to be precautionary with your restoration. It's not a silver bullet to fix all things. Um, it, is, it is but a, a, another tool in the suite of things that, that we should be doing to recover and restore corals. And I um, believe that this text is pretty much locked in. Okay. Go ahead. Oh. Okay, it looked like Dorsetta was going to say something, but I guess not. Okay. Um, were we going to pull up the France? Um, Comments on the, oh, here we go. So you can see here, France has um, come in with a comment on page six, which is just looks like a more of a readability grammar fix there. And then for page nine, um, that the text is also redundant with the footnote. I believe the footnote explains in greater detail what's on page nine. So it's the preference of keeping both um, as sometimes footnotes aren't read and vice versa, people want a little bit more information in a footnote. So if it's okay with the members, we'd like to keep both. Antoine, I see you have your hand up. Yes, uh, thank you. So in, in fact, uh, all comments were not uh, red lines at all. 
it, it was just a matter of uh, readability of the of the addendum. But uh, if the I mean the, the native English speakers countries uh, think that is uh, it's good uh, it's good for them, then we can totally support the addendum as it is. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other comments on the recommendation? I don't see any other hands. So seeing none, I think the recommendation is adopted. Thank you. All right, the next agenda item is a presentation from our ad hoc work on, uh, ad hoc working group on restoration. Um, there's an interest in coral restoration growing with large investments in R&D and an increase in the number and size of projects. The ad hoc committee has been important forum for collaboration between ICRI countries and organizations. There's a motion to extend the ad hoc committee for a further year. If extended, please consider joining and note that some of the tasks suggested in the terms of reference require funding and support. So reach out to the ICRI secretariat if you have such support. And with that, Ian McLeod, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jennifer. So um, I'm based at James Cook University and the um, Australian Institute of Marine Science. And I'd like to start out by um, thanking uh, my friends and colleagues from the Ad Hoc Committee for Reef Restoration. Um, it's co-chaired by myself and Dr. David Suter from Australian Institute of Marine Science. And um, you can see the names of some of the more active members, but um, it's been a really active, um, productive group over the last three years. And it's been an absolute pleasure to work with this team. So the Ad Hoc Committee on Reef Restoration was formed in 2018 in the ICRI General Meeting in Monaco. We have 30 active members representing seven ICRI nations and 14 organizations. Um, the ad hoc committee has been supported by Australia, um, but also with financial support um, from UNEP, particularly in 2019, um, and through the Australian Institute of Marine Science. The way we work, we have um, online meetings every two months um, across two time zones, because it really is a global uh, committee. And we then connect, um, and join the notes from both meetings into a, um, a shared uh, Google Drive folder. Main purpose of the committee has been to connect and share information, uh, review and publish reports and journal articles and facilitate capacity building. So a little recap of our work over the years. In 2019, we surveyed ICRI members about their current and future priorities for coral restoration and adaptation programs. And we also looked at um, the different core restorations which were available around the world and, um, and their efficacy. And I'd like to just um, put a shout out for the ICRI Restoration Hub. Um, so you can find all, these information, all this information, all these reports uh, within that hub and a, a lot of other rich information from across our membership. 2019, we also updated the resolution um, on artificial coral reef restoration and rehabilitation to reflect the changes both in the condition of coral reefs and the um, techniques of coral restoration over the last 15 years. In 2020, our major output was um, the report we produced in collaboration uh, with UNEP, Coral Reef Restoration as a strategy to improve ecosystem services. And then this year, we had the ad hoc committee extended in our um, general meeting in February. And um, our terms of reference for this year was to coordinate international collaboration, advocate for the best practice, um, the use of best practice restoration techniques within a resilience-based management threat reduction and strong climate change mitigation framework as well. So remembering that restoration is just one of the tools in the toolbox. There's also a lot of, um, a lot of research and development happening in this fast moving field. Um, and so one of our, other things to do was facilitate the transfer of new knowledge on restoration techniques to managers and practitioners. One of the highlights from this year was um, to be involved in the ICRI event, Restoring Coral Reefs, Guidelines, Best Practices and Success Stories, uh, which was one of the first um, 
we've actually launched uh, and described the, the guidelines that um, we produce in partnership with UNEP. And those were the first guidelines for the uh, UN decade of ecosystem restoration. That had um, 850 active um, participants in this workshop and, um, and it, was, it got a lot of positive feedback as a successful event. So our key achievements in 2021, um, firstly, we, we've been working with the other ad hoc committees. Um, and I think that shows one of the real strengths of ICRI, um, not only being um, you know, the most broad network of countries and organization, but also um, the willingness to work together um, across different topics. So we had a shared workshop with the resilience-based management ad hoc committee. And um, this resulted, in, and this was about how, can, how does restoration fit within resilience-based management? And the uh, output of this is a, um, a publication led by Dr. Liz Shaver from the Nature Conservancy, Integrated Resilience and Climate Change Adaptation uh, into Coral Reef Restoration, which has been submitted to Global Change Biology. We also worked um, to support the Committee on Developing a Recommendation for a post-2020 Coral Reef Target that you've, you've heard about from Emily. Uh, we also had another um, capacity building workshop you know, there was a lot of uh, knowledge that it's great to have all this research, um, but it's really important this information gets out. And so we talked about, we had 20 people as part of that workshop um, from our ad hoc committee, thinking about what are the best ways we can actually share the information that's being developed. Um, the outcome from that or the decision was uh, to support an existing tool, the Reef Resilient Network mentored course. Um, it looks like there may be funding to make that happen uh, next year. Uh, we also worked with um, Dr. Margot Hine and Francis Stobe um, to, uh, on the Coral Reef Restoration Funding Report, uh, which you'll hear about from Margot next, and um, also uh, continue to work on the Global Coral Restoration Implementation Guidelines. But I think one of the most important things that the uh, Ad Hoc Committee has done is it's great to have a really strategic vision, um, but things are changing so quickly. Just being available as an ad hoc advisory group um, to be able to be a trusted group of experts to be able to provide advice has been one of the greatest strengths of the committee. Um, for example, this year we had the SPREP um, plan of action um, and we were able to provide reviews for that quite quickly. So thank you, Dr. Talivadi, for um, making allowing the use of this. Um, this draft schematic of global coral reef operations. So coral restoration is becoming a um, increasingly um, busy space. And this schematic shows some of the major players sort of mapped out against implementation, um, funding, research, and international coordination. And with that, we've had um, the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program in Australia. Um, this is a really large R&D program with over 250 people involved now. Um, and so this is you know, globally a really significant program. And so to be able to um, pass the, the learnings from, from this program on is really important. And I'd like to draw attention as well that this isn't just looking at the actual interventions themselves, but also um, you know, the modeling and decision support that's required to make decisions, um, the underpinning um, ecological information that we, we need to know to know whether or not an intervention is going to work, uh, but also, you know, really important uh, deployment, um, engineering, integrated logistic and automation, which are going to be so important for, uh, for scaling up restoration and making it cheaper. We've also seen the rise of um, some really large projects, um, such as Mission Iconic Reefs, um, really ambitious project to rebuild um, or you know, increase the health of seven iconic reefs in the Florida Keys. And we recently heard um, from Professor Carlos Duarte on day one of the ECRI General Meeting about some of the really ambitious plans in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This is just one of these. This is the, um, a, a project uh, supported by NEOM and, um, and KALST University um, to build a hundred hectare coral reef at Shusha Island. So that's far larger than I think has been attempted so far. And uh, as we heard from uh, Carlos, that's actually only one of a few projects. So there's a lot happening in the, the space of restoration. Um, and this is also reflected in the ICRI draft plan of action for 22-24 within theme 1C. 
promote and build capacity for the restoration of resilient coral reefs. And this pointed to, um, in light of the th increasing threats from an, uh, a warming ocean and increasing ocean acidification, that some of these new interventions, such as stress hardening, translocation of coral stocks and species, manipulation of symbiotic relationships between the um, symbionts and the coral holobont, uh, managed selection, even genetic modification and engineering of the local environment are really upcoming interventions. Um, they need further testing, um, but it's important to get those into the conversations as well. So we're not just looking, uh, we're actually planning for climate ready restoration. So in light um, of the increasingly busy space around coral restoration and all the different players, the increasing sizes of coral reef restoration projects and the opportunity for funding, um, we, as an ad hoc committee, we, we thought it would prudent to continue our work um, for another 12 months. And um, we've put together a, res a resolution to um, extend that with these draft terms of reference. Um, firstly, providing a coordinating mechanism for international collaboration. So it's nothing quite like a Korea in terms of, um, you know, the breadth uh, of membership and also an opportunity to be, you know, impartial expert advisors. Um, we wanted to continue to advocate for the best practice restoration techniques, um, facilitate the transfer of new knowledge of restoration techniques, maintain the restoration hub. It's, it's a fantastic resource, but there's more information coming out all the time. And um, one of the things that we were talking about earlier was potentially if this um, uh, ad hoc committee is um, sort of runs its course to we need to turn this into an equity network. So it's a standing ongoing um, network on core restoration adaptation. So we'll do a little bit of work exploring that this year. And of course, we want to support the UN Decade of Ocean Science and the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. Along with that, and if resources allow, um, we'd also like to update the Manager's Guide for Coral Reef Restoration Planning and Design, provide mentored training and trained facilitators, and continue to work on the recommendations um, put together by the National Academy of Science, um, a decision framework for interventions to increase the persistence and resilience of coral reefs and to support efforts to improve um, coral reef restoration monitoring, particularly with socioeconomic factors. So uh, that draws to a close my presentation. Um, I just want to say thank you again for the opportunity. Um, I've really, really enjoyed uh, working with this great team and I feel like we've made some, some really good friends along the way and had a lot of fun. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. You've been doing a great job. And um, for folks that don't know, Ian hosts the restoration uh, working groups twice in a day so that he can get as many participants as possible. So hats off to you. That's tough to do. Um, are there any comments on the terms of reference? Not seeing any hands go up. Are there any objections to the adoptions of the terms of reference? Seeing none, so adopted. Um, and a little bit of conversation played out in the chat. Um, I think several other folks have chimed in to um, better address Dr. Crosby's questions um, and the secretariat will reach out to him and see if we can come up with some, some language that better explains what that phrasing means, but I, th I think we can safely say that no one here is suggesting not to restore until we solve climate change and ocean acidification and warming. Okay, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Um, climate change is the greatest threat to coral reefs worldwide. There's growing consensus among coral reef managers that strategies require greater agility to build the resilience of coral reef ecosystems under current climate change trajectories. Resilience-based management uses knowledge of current and future drivers to prioritize, implement, and adapt management actions that sustain ecosystems and human well-being. The um, resilience-based management is also one of the major themes in our draft plan of action. And as with the restoration ad hoc working group, there's a motion to extend the ad hoc committee for a further year as well. Um, Catherine Martin from the Grabumpa, are you, are you ready to go to take the floor? Yes, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I'm so sorry, but we just forgot the presentation of Margot just after 
Jan's presentation. So I'm going to go back to Margot and I'm going to apologize. Sincere apologies, Margot, the floor is yours. Sorry, Jan, to interrupt. Oh, sorry. No apologies necessary. I'm sorry, Catherine. I'll be, I'll be very quick. Let me share my screen. <laughs> Can you see full screen? All right. Well, uh, so, sorry for sorry for the trouble. I'll, I'll jump in very very quickly. But uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to present uh, this report that uh, came out just a few weeks ago, and it's a it's a brand new report. Um, I only have three to five minutes, so I'll keep it very short. But I wanted to start by uh, acknowledging the fact that the report was made possible with generous funding from. The government of Monaco, the Foundation Prince Albert II of Monaco, as well as government offices of Sweden. Now, the need for this report came from uh, some previous bodies of work from both ICRI and the UNEP that highlighted a huge uh, knowledge gap around the funding for coral reef restoration and a critical need to address this gap as we uh, now are entering the UN decade on ecosystem restoration. And the goal of this exercise was twofold. First, we wanted to uh, understand who funds coral reef restoration, uh, where and how. And second, we wanted to try and find some of the gaps in coral reef restoration funding and uh, where those gaps were to help address them uh, as we start um, the decade. So uh, our approach with this report involved first a uh, desktop analysis for which we identified 61 potential funders for coral reef restoration in our networks, and then online surveys with coral reef restoration practitioners and managers that yielded 137 responses. Now for some uh, key results, I'll start with uh, the key number, which is 258 million US dollars that have, have been invested in coral reef restoration in the last 10 to 15 years across 56 countries around the world. But uh, as you'll see on that pictures, the funding uh, is disparate among region. And so there's uh, not the same funding between developed and, and developing nations. It's a big number, but it's a small number in comparison to the 2 billion US dollars uh, that have been invested in coral reefs and associated ecosystems in the last five years. Um, and that number of $2 billion uh, came from a previous report from ICRI and the UNEP. Other key results included the type of funding, uh, which are dominated by government grants and investment from the private sectors. And the timeline of funding, which we found were dominated by short-term grants. With those key results, uh, we provided six key recommendations. The first one is um, an increase in the amount and availability of ded dedicated funding for coral reef restoration is required. The second one is that funders need to account for both short and long-term goals of coral reef restoration. Uh, we found that short-term pulse fundings were necessary to help get project off the ground, but long-term fundings need to be considered to support coral reef restoration projects, which need to be planned for the long-term. Third, we need more research into sustainable funding for coral reef restoration, and that's looking increasing, increasingly hopeful uh, with initiatives such as the uh, Global Fund for Coral Reefs, and I believe we have some, some talk about that later. Fourth, uh, funding accessibility needs to be improved, especially to facilitate funding for those less developed nations. Fifth, funding for coral reef restoration should support greater capacity building. It's important to recognize that coral reef restoration is more than just a coral planting exercise. And finally, better communication on the realities of coral reef restoration is necessary. And this one is mostly to raise funder awareness to what coral reef restoration can realistically uh, achieve and not achieve for coral reefs. So really, we're at a critical point as we enter this new UN decade on ecosystem restoration. Uh, and we hope that this report will help guide the discussions around funding for coral reef restoration in order to ensure that uh, we can both support the reefs and support the funders that want to invest uh, but need proper guidance. 
Uh, on this note, the report is available on that Coral Reef uh, Restoration Hub on the ECRI website. So please go give it a read and don't hesitate to get back to us if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Margo. I am so sorry I jumped right over you. Oh, it's no problem at all, Jen. It's a, it's a busy schedule. <laughs> Okay. Okay, I think we, now we can move on to Catherine. I'll just share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can all see that now. All right. Um, yes, I'm Catherine from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. I'm really pleased to be presenting uh, some of our key achievements over the last year and to be um, outlining our proposed future direction of the committee. So, yeah, just um, for those of you who weren't at the handover event in October, I'm just going to do a quick recap. So the committee was established in 2019 at the 34th ICRI general meeting. It was a result of a workshop that was held by uh, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority in collaboration with the Nature Conservancy, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation and National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So it came about because, as we all know, pressures on coral reefs are intensifying and urgent action is required to protect them. And in the last decade, we've seen an increased incidence of climate impacts with widespread beaching events that have um, led to decreases in coral cover at many sites. So with the climate continuing to warm, we recognise we need to work together to develop management strategies to build the resilience of coral reefs and the communities that depend on them to help them withstand and recover from disturbances. So with that in mind, the objective of the committee has been to identify supports and develop best practice guidance on the actions that will enable members to tailor and scale up resilience-based management to meet local, national and global needs. So under that, we had four supporting objectives that were focused on targeted communications, overcoming challenges, building opportunities and building capacity. So one of the first things we did is we undertook a survey of members' needs and priorities to make sure that the outputs from the committee would be fit for purpose. And um, it was really quite interesting that the survey identified several key gaps. And one of those was that there was a general lack of understanding across the board of resilience-based management. So um, almost 60% of respondents said that resilience-based management is not well understood by their government or key stakeholders in their country or region. So as a committee, we felt it was pertinent to address this lack of understanding, particularly by government, um, because that represents a real barrier to the uptake and implementation of resilience-based management. Um, particularly through, you know, development of strategies and securing of funding. So how do we approach this? Well, we made resilience-based management accessible across each of our four objectives. So under targeted communications, we developed a centralised resilience hub with uh, simple key messages. It's very similar to the restoration hub. Um, we've also got an infographic, which I'm really pleased to be releasing today together with a policy brief. And we hope that these will help members overcome some challenges in gaining support and understanding of resilience-based management. Um, we've also got a list of key contacts you can go to for further information. And the website has a range of resources, um, policies, plans, practical tools, case studies, online courses, and other resources that you can access. Um, and if members have anything they'd like to see, then please do get in touch. If there's anything you've got as a resource that you'd like to share, we can certainly upload that. So this is the Resilience Hub. For those of you who haven't been there, I've uh, put the web, website address down there below. Um, I encourage you to, to navigate there and to have a look because this is going to be the focal point and information portal for resilience-based management. So if we scroll down the page, you can see that there are five boxes and um, that you can click on, so they're interactive. Now, if you um, were to click on the first one, you'll find the policy brief and the animation that I just referred to. And yeah, we'll be releasing those today and I'll talk you through those in a minute. Um, the centre box, Resilience-Based Management News, that's got a range of really useful resources. So virtual capacity building activities like talks and training um, that are run by uh, the Nature Conservancy. And then the last box is the Reef Resilience online course also run by the Nature Conservancy. So 
highly recommend having a look through that website and you know we're more than happy to take feedback because we've tried to make the website and the products available on the website applicable um, to local managers leaders stakeholders so if there's anything you want to see um, let us know now this is a policy brief that i was referring to so the policy brief was one of our key products to address um, the, the knowledge gap so it outlines quite clearly what resilience-based management is and why we need to think about resilience. It's only two pages. Um, and on the first page, we've got an infographic that puts some resilience-based management activities in the context of the whole ecosystem. And then on the second page, you can see um, there's a wheel and it goes, basically the second page outlines actions that decision makers um, can take to build on conventional management approaches to support the resilience of coral reefs and coral reef dependent communities globally. Now, if we zoom in on the circle, you can see that there are three segments of the circle. So governance, ecosystem and community. So basically we're saying resilience-based management requires us to consider the whole system um, and to anticipate future impacts in the context of climate change. So um, really need to have strong governance and political support to be able to um, prioritise, implement and adapt management actions to sustain ecosystem resilience and also um, human wellbeing. Um, so we have developed these actions, particularly for the policy brief. So please do download the policy brief and use it to resource for members. And if you'd like to know more about the three segments um, in the circle and the thinking underpinning that, then um, I highly recommend reading the Reef Resilience Framework. The reference is there on the right published in 2018 by the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. So we really hope the policy brief will empower managers um, by validating the importance of local actions to reduce threats and to build reef resilience. Um, so we are also putting forward a motion to uh, continue the work of the ad hoc committee to provide further support for members to identify and implement resilience-based management uh, actions. And coming back to the survey I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, as well as the general lack of understanding of resilience-based management, the survey also identified that um, members felt they had a lack of technical expertise in that areas and also um, a lack of capability to identify appropriate funding sources to implement actions. So what we're proposing in the, the new terms of reference is one, to assist members to identify and implement resilience-based management actions that support global biodiversity and sustainability targets. So these are things in, uh, for example, the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, and the proposed CBD framework. And then two, if we're able to do that effectively, we'll be able to then assist members to develop the necessary resources that will support um, the incorporation of those actions in resilience-based management plans and policies. We'd like to continue to share our knowledge and expertise on implementing resilience-based management with members. And um, we'd like to develop closer linkages with the um, Ad Hoc Committee on Reef Restoration and the Ad Hoc Committee on developing a recommendation for post-2020 coral reef target. You know, reef restoration and reef resilience really go hand in hand. And it's important that we're all thinking about resilience um, using a common language. So our proposed actions under the terms of reference really relate quite well to theme one in the new ICRI plan of action, promoting resilient coral reefs. And for those of you who've had a chance to look at the plan, um, we particularly support um, the delivery of many items under 1A and 1B, so strengthening policies, supporting conservation and recovery of coral reefs and associated ecosystems through resilience-based management frameworks and promote capacity building for applying resilience-based management approaches to coral conservation. You probably see that the terms of reference um, that are proposed map quite nicely to those. So in terms of the next steps, we will be um, running in early in the new year an online Q&A session to promote the uptake of the policy brief for members. And um, should our terms of reference be accepted, then we'll move ahead with having another joint meeting uh, with the other ad hoc committees. And we'd like to continue to maintain and update the Resilience Hub as resources become available. 
and then we'll start work on developing some new tools and resources to support our new terms of reference and also um, help build capacity through online training. So the figure on the right there shows quite um, nicely how resilience-based management actions really need to go hand in hand with climate mitigation strategies or um, reducing pressures that are also affecting the reef. So yeah, that's already been accentuated in other talks today. Um, I'd like to end on a really um, positive note too, which is our uh, animation that we're just releasing today. I'll just see if this is going to play for everybody. Our beautiful and important coral reefs are under serious threat. Coral reefs are critical ecosystems that support a quarter of all marine life and around one billion people worldwide. Our action today will determine which coral reefs and marine life will survive into the future. Overfishing, pollution and climate change are already impacting the health of our reefs. Coral bleaching and algal dominance have caused large-scale damage to coral reefs globally. But with your help, we can give our coral reefs a fighting chance. Resilient reefs are more likely to recover from impacts like coral bleaching. With resilience-based management, or RBM, we can help reefs stay healthy. RBM means regular monitoring, considering future impacts, and adaptive management to target our actions where they are needed most. RBM tackles impacts at the source by managing and regulating use of the reef, engaging and involving industry and communities, exploring and using innovative approaches, and implementing strong policies. What happened there? Oh, sorry. Yeah. That disappeared. Sorry. Um, hang on. That might be about where we were. In communities, exploring and using innovative approaches and implementing strong policies and plans. RBN can help protect our reefs, but it only works in conjunction with strong action to cut global greenhouse gas emissions. To help you understand what you can do through your work or in your community, the International Coral Reef Initiative, ICRI, have released a resilience-based management policy brief. Let's act together to give our coral reefs a resilient and healthy future. Visit the ICRI website and download the resilience-based management policy brief. Our beautiful... Oh, there we go, sorry. Um, I hope that worked for everybody. Sorry about the stuff up there. I must have just hit my mouse. Um, <laughs> I hope everyone enjoyed that. So that's the animation that we're releasing today to support the policy brief that's also available to members to use. Um, and a big thank you, particularly to Tom at the Ecuador Secretariat for making that happen today. Um, and I'd like to thank all of uh, the community members in the Resilient Space Management Committee for their support, their dedication, and also their enthusiasm in the last year. It's been a real joy working with everybody and I hope that we can go forward and to develop some more products that will really help members. And if people, um, if anyone would like to become a member who isn't a member, if you're interested in learning more, then please do um, also get in touch. We'd like to make sure that our products are um, practical and tangible, able to be used by people. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, are there any comments on the terms of reference or questions for Catherine? Nope, not seeing any hands go up. Um, are there any objections to the adoptions of the terms of reference? Nope, seeing none, so adopted. Um, our next agenda item is to discuss our plan of action. So I will turn over um, the chair position to Christine to take over for that. Yes, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And, and apologies, just having mouse issues. <laughs> um, so, Thank you so much. And I really, that's just amazing what the committees are doing. It's, it's just so exciting. And again, I think the interlinkages are 
as as Catherine said, you know, it's part of what ICRI is about and love the video. It's wonderful. We got to find ways to get that that playing on the in a broader audience so everyone can appreciate it. Um, well, again, thank you everyone for coming back today. Our attendance is really, really amazing. And I know, again, many of you are up at a very, very late hour. Um, I think we had a really good discussion yesterday of the proposed plan of action or on Monday, apologies, on Monday. And, and I'd like to um, open the floor to see if there are any additional comments. We certainly welcome them. Um, also noting though that, that we very much are um, looking forward to getting your written comments. Um, and if you could do that by January 14th, we'd, we'd appreciate it. We'll then compile them and send out a revised version electronically. But, but again, I'd like to open the floor again and see if, if there are any additional comments now. Again, don't worry if, if you don't want to make them during the meeting. Um, please, though, do, do send them in. I think the way we, we manage to make this a really um, positive and impactful three years, we need, we need your help and we need your ideas. So again, um, Ben, thank you for putting, um, Francis, for putting up the themes. One of the things, if, if no one has any comments now, um, we do believe that it's it, to guide our efforts. It would be important if we could operate under a agreed plan, even if it is an interim evolutionary plan. Um, on Monday, we didn't hear any objection to the plan's overarching themes. And as, as you noted in the presentations, uh, the ad hoc committee's activities very much fit within them, as do a lot of the international activities going on in other, other fora. Um, because of this, we wondered whether there, there would be any objection to approving the plan as a framework, as a framing document to help us all move forward. Of course, with the understanding very much that it's an iterative document that will evolve based on your comments and ideas. And as we, we go through our work, I think we wanna make sure that as new things come up, we're able to be flexible and nimble and adapt to them. So none of this would be written stone, but um, we would very much uh, think it would be valuable for all of us to at least have in mind the, the broad themes and framework under which we're, we're operating. So I would like to ask if there are any objections to us moving forward with under that, that approach. And I'll give you a little time because I tell you finding the different places to react and the different buttons, even after two years, it remains a challenge for me. Um, well, I, I am not seeing any objections and therefore not seeing any objections, we'll consider the, the plan of action as a framing document adopted. Um, thank you very, very much. I think it'll help us move forward. And again, please send us comments and ideas by January 14th. And this won't be your only opportunity. Um, Yes, uh, there's a comment. Can we share the comments with the whole group? As we get them, one of the things we were hoping to be able to do, in addition to trying to, to compile and, and put them in, um, we, I work with, with Emily and, and, the, and Francis and the others on the Global Biodiversity Framework. And we don't want to go down that road because that's become very challenging in the negotiations in terms of editing. But one of the things we would like to do is get your comments, incorporate them where we can, go back to you and ask more questions if we have them, but then share with everyone the comments that we received and how we address them. Uh, we think it's very important to be able to do that and have a dialogue with on, on those comments um, in 
along with the, the many challenges that being virtual presents, there are some advantages in a more robust um, ability to connect with everybody across the world uh, on these issues. So um, if that's okay, we will definitely do that. Is there another chat? And again, okay. <laughs> the other item I'm trying to learn is remembering to look in the chat. Again, after two years, you'd think I'd have it done. Um, so given that, um, I think we're doing really, really well um, on our timing. Again, recognizing some of you are up very late, uh, like to, to break now. And um, perhaps we can come back in 20 minutes. That would be at 520. It's a little earlier, but I think we've got some good other activities we want to be able to spend enough time discussing if that's all right with the, the timekeepers here. So we'll break now and see you at Eastern Standard Time 520.
Okay, I think it's been 20 minutes. And we will get back to action here. We need to find the agenda. I have misplaced it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, I think next on the agenda is my presentation, so I won't introduce it since I'm giving it. <laughs> um, and Tom's going to slide uh, do slides for me. So thank you very much. Um, next slide, please, Tom. Um, during the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's presidency of the G20, a workshop titled Advancing Global Coral Reef Conservation was held, and that was on in July of 2020. At that, at that meeting, G20 members recognized the window for the protection of the world's coral reef ecosystems is narrowly and rapidly closing, and no single nation has the capacity to reverse this situation, that international collaboration was key. From this recognition and the G20 environment minister's communique that came out in November of 2020, the G20 decided to establish an r and accelerator platform to deliver the best science and technology solutions to secure a future for coral reefs. Next slide. This wheel is a, a vision put forth by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It was the vision of the founding committee, um, sorry, committee used to negotiate the governance of the platform. The platform aims to deliver novel science and technology, connect existing R&D programs, support an equitable approach taking into account gender and the many disciplines and areas of expertise needed to achieve its stated goals. To that end, we will engage with the private sector, transfer knowledge and training to developing countries and less advantaged, uh, advantaged communities, and we'll have open access to all information and experts at re various research communities and facilities. And ultimately it's the aim to share novel scientific tools for coral conservation. Next slide. Um, this is a schematic that shows the, the various moving parts of the um, here, sorry. <laughs> um, the various parts of the platform. Um, thus far, the IGC or the uh, Initiative Governance Committee has been formed. We've had three meetings, and the most recently was done in December 7th. The Scientific Advisory Committee nominations have made and we're choosing those folks as well. We're missing some expertise on engineering and scaling up. So we're looking for um, some nominees there and hopefully we'll get a few good ones in, in the next couple of weeks. Um, the platform central node has been fully staffed and is operational and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia will fund that central node at $10 million per year over the next 10 years. Um, they've just, I think, within the last couple of days, put up a new platform website with a new logo and content is being developed to flesh that website out. Um, and then lastly, the foundation to raise funds for the first call for proposals is up and running as well. We can go to the next slide. This is a representation of the 15 G20 nations that joined on CORDOP and the various advisory members down the side. So you can see a lot of overlap with, with ICRI. Um, next slide. And then in terms of the initiative governing committee elected officers, your inaugural officers are Dr. Osama Fakia, myself, and um, executive director interim is Professor Carlos Duarte. So you might be asking yourself, how is this different from other large funding initiatives in the coral realm? Um, the platform is working from the premise that currently few techniques for coral restoration have potential for implementation beyond a hectare scale. The cost estimates for multi-hectare projects are in excess of a million dollars per hectare. Warm water coral reefs are projected to reach a very high risk of impact at 1.2 degrees Celsius degree warming, with most available evidence suggesting that coral dominated ecosystems will be non existent at this temperature or higher. So it follows that new scientific and technological solutions are urgently required. 
CORDAP will run globally targeted R&D calls in priority themes selected by the Scientific Advisory Committee to address these critical issues that have already gone over. CORDAP is also the only international organization fully dedicated to funding and scaling up global uh, R&D for coral restoration and conservation, including countries who don't have the funds for their own research efforts. Next slide, please. The next steps are to get all of those different parts up and working together and to get the foundation up and working and fundraising happening earnestly. Um, the infrastructure required to implement the platform is largely put in place and will be ready to go soon. They're targeting 30 million US dollars per year for each one of the calls for proposals for R&D projects. And that's, that's a pretty audacious goal um, in, in a pretty short period of time to get this done soon. The Saudi Arabian government has committed, again, $10 million to the operation of the platform. So no, none of the, the funds donated through the foundation will go to um, platform operations. It'll all go directly into the awards um, that are, are, are decided upon after the first call for proposals. So um, with that, um, I think KAUST is uh, the Kingdom, uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology is largely to be thanked for, for absorbing all those costs and making sure that this happens um, as expeditiously as possible. Um, next slide, Tom. And last is just a little bit of contact information there. Um, so that being said, I am happy to take any brief comments or questions. Okay, so I think maybe we'll just move on to the next uh, agenda item, and that is the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. The Global Fund for Coral Reefs is a blended finance instrument to mobilize action and resources to protect and restore coral reef ecosystems. It was officially announced in September of 2020 with initial investments from Vulcan through the Paul G. Allen Foundation. Um, and the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation, and I believe the German government was shortly thereafter. Um, so to speak on this is Yamanex Batista. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Jen. I just would like to confirm that you are seeing my my screen. Yes, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you very much to, to you, Jan, Christine, Francis, for the great opportunity uh, for the Global Fund for Coral Reefs to be, to be part of this 36 um, ICRI general meeting. And, and for us, it, it is great to, to be working with you now and, and in the very near future. Um, Together, continuing to to close uh, closely link our our mandates and and our common interests for coral reefs, and I'll be talking a little bit about that during today um, today's presentation. I, I think um, for for the group that is attending this meeting, of course, we don't really need to emphasize um, anymore. It's been done yesterday and today already, uh, or Monday and today already several times. The, the critical action that is required to safeguard our coral reefs. But I wanna um, go back to Margot's presentation and, and in her presentation, she was talking about, about the need for, for bringing additional financing to the table to safeguard coral reefs in, in different areas, including restoration and, uh, and otherwise. And that is very much the, the genesis of the GFCR. The, the GFCR, as, as some of you probably already know, um, comes in to, to, to the coral reef scene to be part of those financing solutions that are required to safeguard the most resilient reefs around the world. And, and in that sense, um, after um, the launch of the GFCR, we have been really working very hard to make sure that we can start putting um, the resources that we currently have in, in hand um, into programs on the water and in the ground. 
But I think it's very important to highlight here again what Jennifer said in the in the introduction. We are um, slightly over a year old you know, after being launched in September 2020, and we are the the globally speaking the the first and only so far blended finance mechanism focused on financing coral reefs around the world. And our overall um, aim is to mobilize at least 625 million dollars for the most resilient reefs, safeguarding again those most resilient reefs around the world. Um, our main objective, uh, as you see on screen, is to again invest on those most resilient reefs, safeguarding them and, and reduce the local drivers of degradation that affect the resilience of these reefs. Um, often I like to say that um, we, we are like a reef bank. I'm sure that many of you have heard about um, seed banks and those are initiatives that are aiming to ensure that, that we have seeds from, from plants and um, to ensure the future of agriculture um, against the, the, the challenges of, of different threats, including climate change. And in many ways, our business in the GFCR is to support the fact that we also need to establish um, reef banks. We need to ensure that these most resilient reefs around the world continue to, to be resilient and continue to exist so that they can help um, restore coral reefs into the future as we continue to see the effects of climate change. And that's why within our objectives in the, in the GFCR and as part of our theory of change, we, we work through four main pillars, protecting those resilient reefs around the world. All of our work, our programs are based on, on science that highlights which are those uh, most resilient reefs around the world. A lot of this is being done with, with the support and using as reference the 50 reef studies. Um, second, transforming. Um, those activities that are currently degrading um, the coral reefs and are contributing to, to those um, local drivers of degradation and making those more sustainable changing practices. Three, restoring reefs where, where it makes sense and where, where it can be done. And four, and very importantly, helping communities that are being affected by the shocks of climate change and others to recover from those effects because those communities are going to be essential for that resilience of the reefs. They are in many ways the guardians of, the re of those reefs on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, how, how, do we, how do we work? Basically, we, we are um, a very different type of funding mechanism. The Global Fund for Coral Reefs is, is truly a partnership, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that in a second. But in this partnership, we have right now two main instruments. We have what we call the, the GFCR Grant Fund, which currently, uh, which sits within the, the UN um, system. And through that grant funding, what we are doing is um, establishing with our partners on the ground, which we call convening agents, a series of programs around the world that are going to help incubate and create a pipeline of positive reef projects um, that we hope will be scaled up through other types of financial mechanisms. And that is the, the second side of the, of the GFCR partnership where, where we bring those private sector actors that are going to then help us scale up and unlock those private sector financing to really ensure the sustainability of those reef positive um, business solutions. And, and th that is basically what, what a blended finance approach is. So we are really working with, with our partners, with our donors to deploy those grant resources um, and ensure that those grant resources then can attract the, the private sector actors in, in, into this picture. And one of the key actors and partners of ours in this endeavor is um, Pegasus Capital Advisor, which recently secured um, $125 million from the Green Climate Fund as the initial funding for the GFCR Equity Fund. Um, and currently, we, we are working and supporting Pegasus in, 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 in different ways, but particularly in, to ensure that as we continue to develop the programs that are funded by the grant fund in the, in the GFCR, we, we start from the beginning to build those connections to work together with Pegasus, the convening agents, the governments, and other partners to ensure that we all come together and create these positive reef solutions in a, in a, um, for, for the future of the, to ensure the future of the coral reefs. Um, 
in general, our programs, what they are going to look at in, in terms of building these reef positive solutions is to, to focus on the 10 areas of interventions that you see around that circle. Um, our current programs are currently focusing a lot on, on building this pipeline of, of business solutions around marine protected areas. Many of them um, are linked to aquaculture, sustainable mariculture, sustainable fisheries, um, and so on, waste management. And um, many of them also are helping also to create additional financial mechanisms related to carbon credits, reef insurance. So we are really coming in as an actor that wants to, to ensure the, sustain, the sustainable funding um, for coral reefs, but through a different angle and really bringing in the private sector into, into the table. I think what is important to highlight here is that everything that I've mentioned today would not have really been possible without the engagement of ICRI and a lot of the members um, of ICRI in this process. The, the history of, of ICRI and the GFCR dates back already quite, quite a few years, and, and ICRI has been essential in the process of building the GFCR. I think um, in this slide and the next one, I would like to highlight very briefly uh, a few of those key points, starting by the 2018 Joint ICRI and UNEP report that really highlighted the, the importance of, of increasing the amount of resources for coral reef conservation around the world. Um, the next year in the G7 meeting of environment ministers, also within the context of this meeting, um, recognizing the value of ICRI um, the, the governments of the G7 called upon again for additional resources for coral reef conservation. And later that same year during the CBD COP, um, there, there were additional calls to, to enhance um, actions around coral reef protection. And all of this political backdrop and, and initiatives in the 2018-2019 process were, were really essential for the launch of, of, of the GFCR. But I think one of the major impetus and, 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 and actions that gave momentum to the GFCR's um, birth was actually the ICRI resolution that was taken um, two general meetings ago by, by all of you. And um, this was really essential to highlight the importance of an instrument and the value of bringing an instrument like the GFCR to life and being able to, to, to engage with donors and partners in making this a reality. So from, from that perspective, I would like to really thank on, on, on behalf of the GFCR partnership, um, ICRI, for everything that you have done um, in, in partnership with us to make this a reality. And, and, and we're truly thankful to, to all of you. And we hope that now in the, in the future, we will continue to strengthen this partnership now that we are all ready to fund action on the ground and, and in the water. Um, Having, having said this, I want to highlight this powerful coalition that I've been um, referring to. I think you will recognize in the logos that you see here that we have a lot of complementarity in terms of the ICRI membership and those that are part of the GFCR partnership. First, I would like to recognize, and I believe he might be on the, on the audience, um, Chuck Cooper, who is the chair of our board and um, from Vulcan. Vulcan is, is, is an ICRI member and has already been actively contributing to ICRI and they are one of our founding partners and, and donors in the, in the GFCR. And in the, same, in the same way, we have other, other ICRI members from the government side, like the UK government, Germany, France, Canada, who have also joined the GFCR as key, as key donors and partners of this um, initiative. But I think it's also important to highlight here that this coalition it also has its strength um, in th um, through gains more strengths by engaging with, with other actors that are also part of ICRI. And here I would like to highlight, for example, um, IUCN and other um, international NGOs that are part of ICRI and who are also working with us in different ways. Like we have strategic partnerships with um, IUCN, for example, and we're also working in, in, in our program development with institutions like the Nature Conservancy or, or, or others. And last but, but definitely not least, I think it's very important to recognize that a lot of the countries that in which we are working and in which we will work in the very near future um, in terms of bringing the, the programs 
um, to, to action are also ICRI members. And in a couple of slides, you'll see which is our current country focus, and you'll, you'll see that reflection of the, of the ICRI membership as well um, in that area. And, and I think within the UN sustainable development context, it is, it is incredibly important to highlight this coalition because um, these coalitions are really part, or this coalition particularly, or, um, or ICRI and GFCR, I actually believe, are key coalitions within the SDG 17 um, goal focused on partnerships. And, and it is truly through partnerships that we are really going to help mobilize the resources that we need to mobilize to tackle the crisis of coral reefs and mobilize the science that is also required to tackle the, the crisis around coral reefs and, and so on and so forth. Um, in terms of programming, this is a very quick snapshot of, of where we currently are. Um, in 2021, so this year, we, we have launched programs in the Bahamas, Philippines, Kenya, and Tanzania, which is a binational program, Fiji, and Papua New Guinea. So you can already see that some of the countries in which we have launched programs already this year are also ICRI members. And in 2022, we are going to have a, a massive expansion in terms of our program under the grant fund of the, of the GFCR with many countries, again, that are part of the, the ICRI family being, being also where, where we plan to deploy our resources in the very, very near future. I think here in this next slide, what I would like to offer you is a quick flavor of the kinds of activities that through our grant fund um, and then in partnership with Pegasus, we, we hope to, to, to fund uh, in, in, in this quest to safeguard our coral reefs. And as I mentioned earlier, our main focus is on this business pipeline development, this positive reef business pipeline development. And in the case of our Fiji program, which was the first one that we launched, there are four key initiatives um, or, or interventions. Um, maybe it's a, it's a better word that, that we, are, we are supporting. First, we are working with, with our partners in, in Fiji that you see listed um, in, the, in the slide at the bottom on a sanitary landfill um, and recycling facility that is gonna help reduce runoff um, that is currently going into the sea. Um, second, we are um, working with, with partners there on strengthening the locally managed area network, which includes um, working with, with different actors in, in the country, government, NGOs, and, and so on. We are also um, supporting the development of a technical facility to incubate investable blue economy projects and local capacity building. And this is one of the um, essential, essential parts of the work that the GFCR wants to contribute and, and fund in, into the future. We, we want to ensure that through these types of technical facilities, we can really generate all these businesses um, that are going to, to help generate income and generate sustainable business practices that, in, that benefit the coral reefs throughout the world. And, and last but not least, and one of, the, one of the interventions in our Fiji program that I think is, is most interesting is this non-synthetic synthetic fertilizer factory. Um, the idea around, around this factory is to, to create um, new options for fertilizers that reduce the, the, the pollution that goes into, into the sea, but that also helps increase the yields of, of crops and soil quality. So a lot of our actions are also um, very much linked to the support of other development goals of the, of the United Nations, um, particularly everything that is related to, to food security. We have uh, a lot of programs or all of our programs actually have a very strong gender focus as well, because in, 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 in many of the countries where we work and many of the programs were, that we are currently supporting we are seeing that uh, the stewards of the, of the communities, of the marine resources are, are often women. And we need to ensure that all of our programs are designed with a, with a gender approach. And of course, we have strong links as well in our work under SDG 14 to other development goals as well, including um, SDG um, 15, um, uh, work on, on land and, and others uh, as well. I think, um, Moving on and, and related to, to our governance, I would like to highlight today um, very briefly uh, the general structure of our governance in, in this partnership. So as I mentioned, we have the grant fund 
and, and the current target of this grant fund is to, to raise a minimum of $125 million to be deployed as grants that are going to help, again, to de-risk and incubate this pipeline of, of reef positive solutions. And then we have the GFCR equity, equity fund, which is managed by Pegasus, which has an initial target of raising 675 million US dollars with 125 of that already secured through GCF. And then we have a, a structure in which we have an executive board um, which manages the, the, and oversees the actions of the grant fund. And then the investment committee would be the body under the GFCR equity fund that oversees how those um, investments are going to deploy it from the equity fund. Of course, these two bodies within our governance um, are already um, very much connected and we have a close relationship with, with our partners in Pegasus, but we are also establishing as we speak uh, a third piece of our overall global governance, which is the advisory board of the GFCR. And this advisory board is going to help um, build a bridge between the, the two funding instruments that we currently have in the GFCR and provide overall advice. And um, in that sense, I would like to, to call upon all of you that are listening to this presentation today to take a look at the website listed in the, in the page um, on screen right now, because we do have a, an open call for, for applications for this advisory board, which is gonna close next Monday. And we would really like to encourage all of you that are part of the Coral Reef community to share this call with your, within your networks, but also consider um, submitting an application to be part of our board advisory board. In terms of the composition, and, and here I would like to, to spend a couple of, of, of minutes, um, I would like to highlight that we are extremely grateful to, to ICRI for, for being one and, uh, of our co-chairs, and, and we, are, we are very excited about the opportunity that we will have to work hand in hand with you as part of this um, third piece of, of key governance bodies of the GFCR. And having ICRI as part of this advisory board, I think is, is going to solidify greatly the relationship between, between you and, and us. The second um, co-chair of this advisory board is going to be the Green Climate Fund. This is yet to be formally um, confirmed, but, but it is what we are working um, towards. And then, as you'll see, we have three additional seats, uh, three additional categories of seats within this board of 11 members um, that are going to include scientists, both national and social scientists, national governments or public institutions, and blue economy experts. So the open call for, for applications is for these other nine seats, and you will find all the information again in that, in that website. One important aspect of this as you go through it is that the, the board composition, um, there is a requirement of seven out of the 11 seats being from um, persons, individuals that come from the global south. And for us in the GFCR, this is particularly important because we, we need to ensure that, that we hear and we have those voices from the global south as we continue to, to move forward in this, in this endeavor of safeguarding the coral reefs for our future. Um, very briefly, and you will find more in the website about this, these are the primary functions of this advisory board. In, in general, the advisory board is really gonna help us with our annual planning process, evaluate the impacts of all of our programs, ensure that we are um, abiding and having the best monitoring and evaluation strategies and approaches and, and safeguards for, for, for the environment and, and social issues throughout all of our programming and, and policy. So it's really going to have um, a central function, this, this board in the, in the life of the, of the GFCR. And last but not least, this is my last slide. I would like to highlight some of our key activities for next year. Next year promises to be uh, a, key, a key and important year for, for oceans and therefore for reefs around the world. We look forward to working with ICRI and with many of you that are on this call on what we are calling the pathway to Lisbon and, and beyond. Um, we, we encourage you to, to reach out to us um, to, to look into potential ways in which we can collaborate in the events that are being planned for, for next year. But most importantly, it's not just 
about, about the events. It's how we collectively use these events to continue to raise the voice for, for more financial resources, um, for coral reefs, and to ensure the future of this ecosystem for, for the people um, as well. So with that, I would like to, to thank you again um, for the opportunity to be here with you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Back, back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Yaba. That was a great presentation, very comprehensive. Um, while folks are thinking about any questions or comments that they have, um, I, I think it's, it's obvious that it, through fundraising efforts, both CORDAP and the Global Fund are likely to be asking the same funders for, for, for donations. And it makes perfect sense for the Global Fund and for um, CORDAP folks to be speaking with each other and integrating as best as possible. They really are different initiatives. Um, CORDAP's more the beginning pipeline of developing new technologies and resources to scale up um, restoration activities. And I think the Global Fund would ultimately benefit from those tools and products that come out of it. Um, so if there's any um, initial thoughts on, on how to go about doing that. I know a, a meeting's already been scheduled for January for folks to talk, um, but if ICRI can play a role in um, helping both initiatives move forward um, in parallel, that would be great. Yes, definitely very open to that possibility, um, Jen. I, I think it only makes sense to, to do that. And in fact, several of, of the programs in which we are currently engaged or, or helping you know, that are being developed are also taking a look at, at science and, and research and development. And, and I think we need to, to, to integrate all of those things into, into packages really. And, and for us, it's very important to build synergies with, with other international, regional and national initiatives that can also bring resources to the table so that we can truly create these comprehensive solutions for coral reefs around the world. Thank you. Yeah, I see a couple of questions in the chat. Hopefully um, this little exchange as well as the two presentations illustrated how the two efforts are in fact different. Any other comments or questions? It must be because we're virtual. Normally this is a chatty group. Well, if there, if there are no questions, Jennifer, I just would like to reiterate our availability to, to answer any questions offline. Um, um, I, you can get my information through, through Francis and, and, and write to, to the GFCR, and we will be more than happy to, to speak with anyone, um, particularly as it comes to, to developing those partnerships, talking about the importance of 2022 for oceans and coral reefs. Thanks. Great. So looks like we can move on to the next portion of our agenda, which is upcoming events. And we've got several rapid fire presentations. Um, first up is our ocean conference in Palau. Um, and Yimnang Golbu will be giving us a presentation from Pickrick. Yim, you ready? Yes, uh, thanks so much. So uh, Jen, and uh, good to see you. And uh, last time uh, we saw each other was during the task force meeting in Palau. So hopefully we can see you in, in February. Uh, our ocean conference uh, will be held in February 16 and 17 in Palau. So this will be in person uh, uh, with all the speakers and moderators that uh, we're hoping to be able to, to come here to Palau and, and hold this uh, in-person meeting. The theme for the seven our ocean conference is uh, our ocean, our people, and our prosperity. Uh, Palau is hosting it in Palau with a partnership with uh, the United States. Uh, and uh, we're also working with our uh, other partners uh, on hosting uh, this conference. The ocean conference is uh, uh, really a conference about uh, commitment, uh, about actions. Uh, so during the ocean conference, this is a time where uh, People present about the commitment uh, they're making toward ocean protection and also about the work they're doing uh, to help uh, our oceans. It is uh, also a venue that uh, where uh, governments, industry, foundations, and civil society uh, come together uh, to build partnership uh, and take actions uh, on our oceans. 
There are uh, six main areas that we will focus on. Um, climate change, uh, fisheries, uh, blue economy, marine protected areas, uh, maritime security, and uh, marine pollution. Uh, so these six areas, uh, we'll go through the six areas in the two days of our ocean conference. There will be, uh, there also be side events. Uh, the call for side events uh, uh, should go up uh, early next week. Uh, and so we would uh, asking uh, people who are interested in in, in, in holding side events that address the six areas uh, to uh, sign up for those uh, side events. Uh, the call for commitment is also going up next week uh, uh, with more detail on the uh, different, uh, the six areas of uh, focus uh, for the conference. Uh, that's all and we hope that uh, to see a lot of uh, ICRI members uh, uh, in person in Palau in February, thank you. Thank you, Yim. Any quick questions or comments for Yim? No, okay. So next up, we've got Madhushri Chatterjee from the Natural Resources and Interlinkages Branch Division for Sustainable Development Goals Department of Economic and Social Affairs on the UN Conference for 2022. Hello everyone. Uh, can you hear me and can you see me? Yes and yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, I wanted to thank uh, ICRI for inviting uh, you and Dessa to do a brief uh, sort of information sharing on, uh, on the UN Ocean Conference. Um, ICRI has been a valuable and very uh, steady partner in all our work uh, related to SDG 14. And I wanted to thank ICRI for that. Um, just to give you a brief uh, update uh, on the Ocean Conference, um, as you know, this conference was postponed from uh, 2020 due to the pandemic, uh, and now uh, through a resolution, a General Assembly resolution, which is uh, the protocol that we, um, we uh, follow, uh, since this is a UN Ocean Conference, uh, through a decision uh, the dates have been now set for uh, 27th June through 1 July uh, in 2022. Um, the venue will still be Lisbon, Portugal, and um, Portugal and Kenya retain uh, the co-hosting responsibilities of uh, this conference. Um, so the you know your your meeting and of course this presentation comes at a timely moment because co-hosts have just started again uh, you know resuming discussions around the conference uh, its its logistical issues and of course substantive matters as well. Um, relevant UN department and agencies have uh, started to discuss uh, issues related to preparations for the eight interactive dialogues for which concept notes will be revived and updated um, based on latest data and analysis post COVID. Uh, then there will be uh, preparations for a third round of special accreditation for stakeholders in early 2022. Uh, this, this round of accreditation will start in on the 17th of January as as was decided just last week. Um, and of course, then we have other matters uh, such as special events around the conference and a renewed communication strategy to talk about the conference um, and just, you know, outreach and, uh, and of course, uh, spread the word um, uh, wide and loud and clear. And finally, a very important piece of the, the conference itself is um, the, uh, the intergovernmental negotiations on a draw on the political declaration, which will be a big part of the outcome of the conference. The overarching theme of the conference remains uh, as before, which is scaling up ocean action based on science and innovation for the implementation of goal 14, uh, which is stock taking partnerships and solutions which was decided, this, this theme was decided by GA Resolution 73 to 92 about three years ago. 
um, what member states are saying uh, and continue to say is that to tackle major global global environmental problems, including the triple planetary crisis that we're currently facing, evidence-based policies based on science and innovation are more important than ever. And uh, ocean is no exception in this area. Um, so, ICRI, uh, just to give uh, everybody an up, uh, uh, some information uh, in case people are not aware, ICRI is a member of the inf informal preparatory working group for Interactive Dialogue 3, which is minimizing and addressing ocean acidification, deoxygenation, and ocean warming. And, um, you know, ICRI is a very important member of this uh, preparatory working group, and I want to thank ICRI for all the effort and contributions made in this regard. Uh, on our end, on DESA's side, of course, we are uh, sort of following all these tracks of work leading up to the conference, for instance, uh, the logistical preparations, of course, the substantive preparations, and of course, the communication strategy. We work with a wide range of um, partners. Most importantly, of course, given that we are the Secretariat, the UN uh, specialized agencies, funds, programs, and other Secretariat uh, departments uh, who help us in all these uh, areas. If you need more information, please reach out to us, but also please go to our uh, website. I can share the correct URL uh, with Francis and with the uh, Secretariat so that can be shared widely again, uh, of course, within this cohort as well. Uh, we are updating this website now with the latest information. Uh, so please visit it regularly for all the information uh, that uh, you need. Um, finally, I would uh, like to say that uh, you know, DESA has been over the past two years trying to keep up the momentum under the guidance of the Special Envoy for the Ocean um, on action related to SDG 14 implementation and of course ocean action in general. We have partnered with a variety of uh, entities including CBD uh, and of course uh, other uh, agencies, funds, programs, and other stakeholder groups who have made commitments to the voluntary commitment registry that you know which came out of the 2017 conference. Um, so I want to basically stress that, uh, you know, this registry of voluntary commitments for ocean action remains open. Right now we have about 1600 voluntary commitments. And, uh, you know, we urge you uh, to spread the word with your um, collaborators and partners to make more uh, commitments and register them in our registry uh, so that we can continue to do good work on the implementation of SDG 14. Um, I will now stop here, but I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? I'm sure we all have lots, but we just don't know where to start. <laughs> Big effort. <laughs> okay, well, we can move on then to the 15th International Coral Reef Symposium. And we've got um, Andrea Gritoli from ICRS. Hello, just give me a second here. Thank you for having me. This is just a brief summary of where we stand on the ICRS meeting that's upcoming. This meeting was originally scheduled for 2020 due to the pandemic. We held a virtual meeting, the 14th International Coral Reef Symposium this past July. And we are now scheduled to have a in-person meeting this coming July 3rd through the 8th in Bremen, Germany. The deadlines are now being set. We are still um, somewhat flexible as the pandemic landscape continues to evolve. But as it stands, we will be accepting abstract submissions in the early part of 2022. Um, 
abstracts that were submitted for 2020 and rolled over to 2022 will uh, be also honored. And so we expect there to be some new abstracts as well as about 1200 rollovers from earlier submissions. We have um, early registration deadline, deadlines for registration for in-person attendance that's a little earlier to account for some of the food planning that needs to happen as well as um, registration almost up until the day before the meeting for virtual attendance. And this meeting will be somewhat hybrid, not 100% hybrid, but we are trying to incorporate as much virtual as possible, given that we are aware that um, some people will still not be able to travel or not be comfortable traveling. And so the plenary talks, this is just showing what components of the conference will be in person and virtual. Plenary talks will be in person and broadcast live virtually. Session talks will be in person and you will also have options to, there will also be a virtual element to that. Talks that are presented in person um, right now, we're thinking of recording them all and also making those virtually accessible. Posters will all be uh, virtual and then individuals that are at the meeting can also present them in person. We will host once again a science to policy event, which will be a panel discussion, including invited speakers, dignitaries, ministers, and policy and decision makers. That will be held in person and broad, broadcast live with a virtual interactive components. Um, the only elements that will not be virtual will be some workshops will not be virtual. Uh, field trips will be in person only and the banquet will be in person. But we are very excited to have this meeting. It's been a long time coming. We've been working on it since 2017. Um, and hopefully we will be able to meet in person. I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible in 2022. And I'm happy to answer any questions about the upcoming meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, long time coming. I hope this next one comes off. We're all looking forward I to it. too. <laughs> I would love to see all of you this summer. I'm in France now, so I'm closer to the venue than ever. And it would be great to see this succeed. But we know that things are tough and we will most likely be um, hybrid in some fashion. Um, any additional questions or comments for Andrea? Okay, we will move on to World Wetlands Day um, with um, Yerker Temelander. And it's great to have Yerker back. It's been a while since we've seen you at a NICRI meeting. Um, thank you very much, Jen. Uh, great to be back. Um, and just a moment so I can share my screen. So um, there you should have the World Wetlands Day 2022 jingle. Um, World Wetlands Day is organized on the 2nd of February next year as an urgent call for greater investment of financial, human and political capital to conserve wetlands and ensure that they are used wisely and, and sustainably. Um, this is done under the theme of wetlands actions for people and nature. And, uh, this day calls on all stakeholders to value wetlands for the multiple gifts that they give us and the nature-based solutions that they can provide. Um, it calls on us to manage them wisely and to use them sustainably so that we can keep benefiting from those services. And of course, to restore them, to revive life where it has been lost, because as most of you will know, uh, wetlands are highly degraded around the world. Um, wetlands, um, uh, this, uh, this World Wetlands Day actually is, is uh, particular to us. Uh, 
2021 marks the 50th anniversary of the convention. Uh, so the decision by the General Assembly to declare World Wetlands Day a UN observance is a very fitting celebration of that. Um, this resolution was sponsored, co-sponsored by 75 member states, and it recognizes the essential role of wetlands in achieving sustainable development. And it notes that wetlands are facing uh, the highest rates of loss of most ecosystems in the world. And importantly, it invites UN agencies, other organizations, and other stakeholders to take action. So it provides a great opportunity to engage across stakeholder groups and to step up efforts. Um, in this regard, uh, we have a, a few requests to those of you who wish to engage in this. Uh, uh, simple actions can go a long way if, uh, if many choose to take them. We invite uh, ICRI, ICRI members and, and your respective constituents to prepare messages uh, that uh, support the World Wetlands Day messaging, to integrate the messages that we share and the visuals we have uh, to the extent possible in your communication activities, certainly to disseminate information about World Wetlands Day and encourage other entities uh, to observe. Um, and, uh, and last and certainly not least is to please share some experiences uh, with us in order to help us to report on implementation to the General Assembly at the next session. Um, there's a link on the screen to campaign assets and additional information that I uh, really encourage you to make the most of. Now, uh, you're probably most of you should be familiar with this, but uh, why bring this up in an ICRI meeting? Uh, the reason for that is, of course, that the Convention on Wetlands uh, defines uh, wetland. And, uh, and that definition includes coral reefs as well as associated ecosystems. So that means that the 172 contracting parties to the convention strive towards implementing their commitments also in coral reef areas, in associated ecosystems, and they may leverage ICRI and its outputs in that regard. Um, and indeed, I think uh, much of what uh, takes place within ICRI, uh, the products that come out of it, can, can greatly support parties uh, implement the convention provisions. Um, an example of that could be that parties use international designation, the wetland of international importance, and strategic protection and restoration of wetland area to reduce uh, local pressures on reefs while also reducing land-based pollution from the watershed. Um, <clears throat> in that context, it's also uh, perhaps uh, meaningful to, to mention uh, a resolution from our last conference of parties, which specifically addresses blue carbon ecosystems and encourages parties to incorporate their protection and restoration in nationally determined contributions. Um, so this speaks to some of the themes uh, of the proposed Secretariat Plan of Action, especially perhaps the one on, on resilience-based management. Um, I also take the opportunity, uh, since this took place today, to, to draw your attention to the um, Global Wetland Outlook Special Edition 2021. Um, it's available in the three languages of the convention on the web, the link is on the screen, uh, along with the materials that support outreach. This provides an update to the Wetlands Outlook published in 2018. Um, it's based on more than 30 major global assessments, regional assessments and new scientific findings from the past three years. I won't go through findings in detail, suffice to say that uh, wetlands are still being lost at alarming rates, far exceeding terrestrial ecosystems, with 40% of species directly dependent on wetlands. Uh, they have to be central to biodiversity conservation efforts. And um, there's also increasing recognition of the fact that wetlands are crucial for water security, for meeting sustainable development, as well as climate change adaptation and mitigation goals. And this prevents perhaps presents um, some opportunity for changed outcomes. Um, in this context, and going back to discussion here, it's interesting to note that in order to have any chance of keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees, we need to maintain remaining peatlands intact, and we need to restore 50% of drained peatlands by 2030, which translates to re-wetting over 2 million hectares per year in the coming years. So, while coral reefs were a critical element in having the 1.5 goal written into the Paris Agreement, peatlands are a critical element in achieving that goal. And that may be interesting to consider in the context of discussions on restoration and certainly in the context of the UN decade. So building back better has 
to entail building back wetter. And that's basically the publication in one sentence. Um, there's a few notes, of course, in the, in the publication also on how the convention can be leveraged. So with that, uh, thanks for giving the, me the opportunity here. Uh, the focal point for World Wetlands Day is to my colleague Sharon. Her contacts are on the stream. Please do reach out to her and feel free to reach out to me as well uh, in relation to other matters connected to the convention. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Yerker. Building back better is building back wetter. I think we need to get President Biden with talking points. <laughs> Any questions or comments for Yerker? No? Okay. And next up, we've got Tali Vardy, who's with the NOAA Core Reef Conservation Program, um, speaking about uh, Reef Futures 2022. Hi, yes, thanks, Jen. Um, I was so focused on sharing my screen, I forgot I had already taken myself off of mute. Um, can you see the screen? And you can hear me and see? We can see your desktop, not your presentation. Oh, strange. Uh, okay, let me try that again. Sorry about that. There we go. That's good. Okay. Okay, yes, so I was asked to just say a couple of words about refutures and I'm going to say a few words. Oh, I won't talk too fast. I'm going to slow down, but I am going to leave time to show a video at the end because I think the best way to understand what refutures is like is to show a video. Um, so one second here. Um, I just wanted to give a overview for folks who might not know what ReFutures is. It's really it's really the only global um, meeting that's focused on coral restoration. We had our first one in December 2018, so three years ago. Um, feels like longer. Um, and uh, the last um, two scheduled ones were postponed, but we're actually having a virtual meeting this week. Um, I think a lot of us <laughs> might be really a little bit punchy and tired by this point in the week with all of these long virtual meetings. But I have to say it was, um, it surprised me at how interactive and, and fun and what great content there was up there. And it's not too late. We had um, day one, um, over the kind of previous, previous like 36 hours. And day two actually starts in about an hour and a half from now. So if you haven't registered yet, you can at refutures.com. Um, it'll be a two and a half to three hour meeting and it's been quite good so far. And um, yeah, just it's a really very interactive platform. And tomorrow we have talks from Peter Harrison, Kristen Marhaver, um, some of the Coral Restoration Consortium's working groups, um, and from Andrea Gratoli, who just spoke um, here this evening. So I guess a lot of us are speaking at a lot of different places. Um, so yes, that is the virtual version. And then ReFutures 2022, I can't say a lot about um, exactly who's speaking and when, but what I can say is that ReFutures is a very, very dynamic and interactive meeting. It's very different from traditional science conferences. We have a lot of hands-on workshops. Um, we have, um, we had a youth summit last time. We'll probably have that again, I hope. Um, and basically our, our kind of motto is that you can't build a coral reef community without having a community and you can't have a community without having fun <laughs> so we try to make it really fun there's happy hours and field trips and stuff like that um so i'm just going to show a quick i'll show the sponsors really quick for 2022 and then tell me if this moves over to facebook jen yeah okay good so far Okay, so this was just a total surprise at the very end of the last three futures. This happened just spur of the moment. Oh, can you hear it? Can you hear? Nope. Oh. 
Oh no, it's on my headphones. You can hear it? No. Mm -mm. <laughs> oh, I wonder why it's not playing. When you, when you share a screen, there's a little button on the bottom left that you have to share the audio or optimize for audio for it to work when you do stuff like this. Okay, well, you just can't beat that kind of advertisement, so I had to show it. <laughs> Thank you, Tali. And um, had had I thought to do this, we could have challenged Scott Heron to do this at ICRI last year because this is the musical renderings of the wonderful Scott Heron who did this oh my God. over a couple of beers the night before, wrote it all up. <laughs> exactly. I mean, he's a genius. All credit to him. <laughs> All right, any questions for Tali? Nope. And if you haven't had a chance to look at the, um, it's showing at three different times. So it's optimized for, for different parts of the world. Um, the, the first day's worth of presentations were very good and um, a lot of information rapid fire. So I'm sure day two will be equally as, as good. All right, I think that brings us to the end of new upcoming events and we are now into next steps for the secretariat so i will turn the mic over to christine yes thank you jen and thank you so much for all those great um both the presentations and what's come upcoming i mean it just it's very exciting it's a very action-packed year um I'd like to say that we have accomplished a lot during this, this short virtual session. It's, it's hard and I think Tally just made the point, you know, sitting on a virtual session for hours, um, for a few hours always is challenging, um, but your participation and just gathering and seeing all the names is, is really exciting. It's good to know that the ICRI community is, is alive, is doing well and, and prospering. And while there are a lot of advantages to a virtual world, it, it does allow us to gather without long flights and, and red eyes as we call them, um, and allows us to overcome some of the challenges we're facing in um, these perilous times. It has some really very, real drawbacks, including not being able to, to talk to each other outside the formal sessions. And, and frankly, that's one of the things that, that I have always been uh, most fond of at the ICRI meetings, because it really is a family. I go to a lot of international meetings and they're wonderful and we do great things, but the, both the camaraderie, the informality, and just the the partnership and commitment and dedication in ICRI, I've not seen matched anywhere else in, in my, my long career, which I won't share how long that's been. Um, so 
but but despite that uh, and these challenges, we have three new members. It's very exciting. Um, we're looking forward to to reviewing the other applications we received a bit too late to take up, but but we look forward to being able to do that. We've adopted a framework for the plan of action that I think will help us all move forward um, and and perhaps not you know not strictly do it but but help to organize some of our thinking again in in more thematic ways that that resonate and the way that the the ad hoc committees um, relate to one another we're hoping that having thematic approach will also do that for our work over the next three years. We've of course um, adopted an addendum to the ICRI post 2020 recommendation to the Global Biodiversity Framework Target 2 on restoration. I mean, I can't say enough about, about the work that, that Emily and Francis and others have done to push this idea forward in, in what can only be described as a, a challenging atmosphere of the open-ended working group um, where a lot of different people have a lot of different things they want. They're, they're committed, they're passionate, they want to be able to move forward. But at the same time, we're, we're bound by, by certain uh, restrictions and they really have done a tremendous job. And many thanks again to Vulcan for supporting it over, over these last, last few years. Um, we've adopted amended terms of reference uh, for the Ad Hoc Committee on Restoration and for the Ad Hoc Committee on Resilience-Based Management. Again, really important committees doing exciting things. I mean, I'm just kind of blown away by, by all the outputs that they, um, they've had and are looking to had, uh, have over, over the next few years. So in terms of next steps, um, we are very much looking forward to hosting the 37th general meeting of VICRI. Um, we really want to do it in person. Um, again, is our challenging times. There's lots of, lots of unknowns. Um, we are looking to do it in the second half of 2022, but again, with so much going on right now, it really would be unwise to try to suggest or plan for specific dates or for venues, um, but we'll certainly be in touch as, as events unfold. But in between and before we gather as an ICRI family again, there are many, many other choral activities that keep us all busy. Um, certainly there's the work of the ad hoc committees. I think they've, they've got a lot planned intersessionally and really do, um, do engage, do, do join in that really important work. And as we heard today, there are some very exciting upcoming events that the fo focus on oceans, but have real components like ICRS is all about coral reefs. Um, we hope you may be able to engage, participate either in person or virtually in these. And I'm sure that there are many other events that, that have been planned that we're not, um, we may not know about and we weren't able to touch upon here today. Please, um, if you learn of other coral reef events, of webinars, anything, uh, coral reefs, um, as, as Jürger pointed out, all the associated ecosystems, anything, please, or you're thinking of hosting or planning a coral reef related event, particularly in an international forum, please do let us know as we would welcome the chance to share the information and to help coordinate throughout the ICRI family. We wanna make sure that, that everyone knows everything that's going on. Um, I'd like to open the floor one last time, just, just to see if anyone um, would like to share any additional items. I'll take a minute here. Um, so I am pausing 
for a minute. It's, it's one of those things I've, I've certainly never worked in um, television or anything, but one time I was in a recording studio and I remember looking and someone was going, doom, doom, and I went, what are they doing? And that means stretch it out. Um, Assistant Secretary of State Monica Medina very much wishes to join us. She was very disappointed yesterday and she is joining us. Uh, we are just trying, she's having a little trouble making the connection. So if if people can bear with us just a few more minutes, um, I'm going to, ah, Assistant Secretary, I see you there. Um, so without further ado, may I introduce the Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans and International and uh, Environmental and Scientific Affairs, Monica Medina. Monica? The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, and thanks to everyone. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I'm really sorry to have missed my um, opportunity to speak to you at the opening uh, on Monday, but I'm really pleased to be able to join you now. I hear that your discussions um, in the two sessions that you've had and all the presentations have been incredibly rich and um, I look forward to hearing even more about them from Chris uh, once uh, the meeting wraps up. Um, your work is inspiring to me and um, so, so very important and inspiring to all of us uh, who love coral reefs and um, want to see them vibrant everywhere all over the world and protected as much as they can be. Um, and we know that the threats continue to mount against coral reefs. So we are really grateful to everyone for all that you're doing. Um, the U.S. is, of course, especially committed to um, addressing those threats. There are two very important ones, as you know, both climate change and biodiversity loss are really hammering coral reefs right now and um, the cascading crises that lead from those two make this even more complicated. So we have to use all, all the tools, all the assets, all the commitments, all of the elbow grease and hard work and volunteers. I think often about the National Marine Sanctuary Program in NOAA where I used to work and how much of it is um, Many of, the, many of the sanctuaries are based on reefs and the volunteers there are just tremendous in the way that they help. And um, again, organizations like this one help to pool our collective efforts, help us to um, help each other. And that's really so important um, as we go forward. Uh, you know, I'm thinking back about the UN climate change meeting in Glasgow and it's still sort of fresh in my mind. Um, how much momentum that started to build around climate and climate issues and also around oceans. You know, we got some language into the Glasgow Agreement um, on oceans that um, had never been in it before. So I think that's a great um, way to set momentum for uh, helping to resolve um, the issues uh, that uh, surround coral reefs and climate. Um, and I think, you know, the continued push towards elevating ambition, you know, is going to help us uh, sort of in that rising tide, lifting all boats way, you know, as long as we're, we're pushing countries to elevate their ambition and come up with new and more um, and different ways of addressing the climate crisis in their own um, NDCs, their own national plans, we'll see benefits in places like coral reefs um, that we probably hadn't before. And of course, we know that that meeting wasn't the finish line, but in fact, just the beginning. And um, what we really are focused on, particularly in this decade of ocean science, is the sprint to 2030, which seems like a like an 800 meter, or maybe it's a one mile sprint. It's a long way away, but we have to run fast to get where we want to go. A lot of work remains to be done in the scientific realm. Um, and uh, you know, I'm I'm really pleased um, that this is the decade of ocean science, and I think that will lead to a lot of great advancements in this particular area. And we're working hard in the U.S. to do our part on that. Um, 
again, in the US, we're also thinking about protecting our own lands and waters. And we have an initiative called the America the Beautiful Initiative that President Biden um, is working very hard to implement. And we've made the big commitment to conserve at least 30% of our land and waters and 30% of our ocean and the global ocean um, by 2030. So, as well as global land. So we've not only made the commitment domestically, but we're committed to working with countries around the world to help them make the same commitment everywhere. Um, and marine protected areas will be a really important part of that effort. MPAs are critical management tools to conserve biodiversity, self safeguard the health of marine ecosystems and tackle the climate crisis. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time actually recently digging into the areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, so even thinking about the high seas and how to have greater protection in high seas areas that uh, belong to no one is high on my list of things that will be important to do um, in the year ahead. I also wanna mention thinking about, you know, particular places that really um, are special um, that my own attention is on um, Kiribati and the Phoenix Islands Protected Area, also known as PIPA. It's, it's been in the media a bit um, in the last few weeks. And I think it's a reminder that we can't sort of take for granted that once protection happens, it will be uh, permanent. These areas that um, small countries like Kiribati um, are, are creating need the help of all of us to figure out how to sustain them. And Kiribati is, was a leader. They were one of the initial countries that actually staked out a huge area in their exclusive economic zone. Um, and it became a UNESCO recognized area. It's so important. Um, so I think that focuses me on how we in the US and others in um, organizations like this one need to sort of think about the places where, um, where we could lose ground and, and work hard to shore up those areas and make sure that we haven't. Um, you know, we, we can't afford to lose places like Pippa where the reefs are so vibrant and full of life, where giant fish and giant clams, you know, are, are there in abundance. And, um, and, and it, we know that in these areas, coral reefs can be much more resilient to some of the stressors I was talking about at the beginning. It's, it's through the kind of comprehensive protection that we know we need that we can actually pre preserve these areas for the future, even as they um, take on uh, shocks and, and um, other global um, you know, uh, shocks to their systems. Um, so you know, I, I think about Pippa and then I think about our own Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument and um, you know, how much it matters to our country to have protected that. I know um, how much it meant to former President Barack Obama to protect that. And, and I think um, we, we want to continue to find those very important coral reefs around the world and make sure that they're protected. Um, so, or restored, in fact. Um, and I know that's a great focus of your work. So I want to thank you again for all your dedication and your commitment and your persistence, um, all your know-how, all your hard work, all the time you spend um, overtime, you know, crazy hours trying to meet when, um, you know, when we can all get together. It's, it's different time zones for everyone, but I know we all share that spirit of um, dedication and commitment to, uh, to the work that lies ahead. And so... With so much to be got, to be done, I you know I know you all feel the urgency, and I just want to say I feel it too. And if there are ways that I can be supportive in the role that I'm in, or where Chris um, can be supportive, I know in this leadership role that the U.S. is is taking on this year, we're very very excited about it and want to make a lot of progress in 2022. We're really looking forward to that. So thank you again for all your work. Thanks for um, letting me. Uh, jump in here at the end to cheer you on and let me know how I can help you going forward in this important year. Thanks so much. Happy holidays to everyone. And uh, I look forward to hearing more about the work um, ahead. Over to you, Chris. 
Thank you, Assistant Secretary. And, and with those inspiring words to send us forth, uh, I will close the meeting. Just a quick note that the follow-up information and documents on the recording of the general meeting will be communicated with everyone. And the summaries will be posted on the ICRI uh, event page, uh, GM 36. So thank you again, Assistant Secretary Medina. Thank you all for joining us and go out and do great work. And we look forward to gathering again, 2022, hopefully in person. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. That was that was just great. I am I am, you know, your organization, Francis and Tom, was was perfect down to the minute. And uh, thank you, Amon, and your team. And thank you so much to the interpreters. My apologies for not recognizing you um, at the end of the meeting. Uh, it was a little too close. <laughs> Getty, thank you, thank you so much. Um, your your work is amazing. I don't know how you do it. Don't know how. It's a great pleasure, Christine. Thank you, thank you. It's always a big honor. We are very proud and happy that we bring our contribute to such a nice a group of people. First of all, because yeah. that's make the project work. Yeah. So thank you for allowing us to participate. Thanks a well, lot. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great, great team. All right. All right. Time for the Europeans to go to bed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. To, to go yeah. home before. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, thank uh, so, uh, should we catch up quickly tomorrow or no? Or we do it later or we do it by email? Um, I'm fine with tomorrow or, yeah, I don't have another bureau meeting. You want to I, I, our normal time, eight o'clock our time? Eight o'clock our time? Uh, wait, eight. We, you know, I, th I think we can also do it by email. Okay, let's, do, yeah, because I have a call at this time. So yeah, let's do it by email. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you all very much. You make okay. it look easy and I know it's not. You make it so easy. Yeah, it just, you know, I was I was texting people. We need her now. We're out of the meeting. Oh, well. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone. Okay, have a good evening. Talk to you soon. Good night. Be safe out there. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.